Thanks a lot, Jana. That was interesting. Um, other questions from the floor? Otherwise, I'll, I'll start. Um, do you have an idea why we see that increase in C name based tracking over the years? Why do people move away from other tracking methods? And another one is should we as general users be worried? Um, well, hold on. I'm just trying to <clears throat> start my camera. Okay, uh, well, so first of all, we saw that third party tracking is used complementary to C name based tracking, but C name based tracking is used specifically to target users who are aware of their privacy and are trying to use tools. And I think that the general awareness of privacy on the web is just increasing. There are more and more people who are trying to use alternative browsers or browser extensions. So that's maybe also the reason why more and more websites are trying to switch to CNAME based tracking. And that's the reason that it increases. And as users, should we, should we be worried? Well, depends. <laughs> What kind of tracking protection are you using? Um, it is certainly worrying for me specifically the fact that it is meant to deceive users who are trying to protect themselves from trackers and that they the method is meant to not be transparent towards users. That I think that is the main issue. So the, the, the data that is gathered through this, is it it's gathered by these companies that sell you C name based tracking, right? Why is that actually so expensive? I, I saw the prices and it looked like um, um, rather unreasonable. Uh, honestly, I don't know why it's so expensive, I guess, because there is a market for it. Um, I'm not familiar with the prices of third party tracking either. I think, uh, for instance, Google Analytics is free because they want to promote it. But I, I'm not I'm not sure about other services. But yeah, some of them there's also some of them have a price per user. So I, I'm not sure why it's so expensive. What is a user in this case? A website, I guess. Um. Uh, yeah. Well, the website has to pay certainly, but I think the number of users they are able to track can also be kept. And, and do you know, did anyone ever do subject access requests to these country uh, companies and try and find out what data they actually get about users? Mm, uh, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still baffled and not understanding how detailed the information you actually get about a user through this kind of tracking is where a user in this case is the person behind the browser. Well, I guess it's mostly your browsing habits. I mean, it depends on the website. I, uh, sometimes the fact that you're even visiting, for instance, some website about religion is enough in itself. It's sensitive information. So I guess it's mainly the browsing behavior. Okay, let's let's start and go through the questions. There's yep. only coming in. So there's one from Stefan that is related to the discussion we're having right now. He writes that Google announced that Chrome will stop supporting cookies as of 2022. Um, is is there an impact of these news to your research results? Um, I haven't heard of this actually. It's interesting. Yeah, so that's what I mentioned that uh, Chrome right now does not offer by default protection of tracking, uh, but they are planning on phasing out third party cookies in the future. Um, I guess that's what you're referring to. And it's, it's only third party cookies. Uh, yeah. Okay. So which would make it impossible for third party tracking. Um, there, we didn't see an immediate impact because this announcement was only just recently made in our study. The most recent results are from October 2020. Then we have a question from Matthias. Which protection mechanisms do you recommend, recommend for end users? Mm. Well, 
Um, as we see here, the, certainly using the uBlock origin for Firefox is better than Chrome. Also, if, you, if you're using a browser, you should have a look at your settings. Um, even if it's not offered by default in Chrome, you can still block your cookies. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it's a cat and mouse game between the trackers and the blockers. So we can never be 100% sure that our privacy is fully protected when using these tools. What about the typical, very privacy conscious person who's using Tor for most of their browsing activities? Are they vulnerable? Um, I'm not very familiar with Tor, so I'm not sure what the effect of using it will be on this specific method. There is another question from Peter. Did you look at the cookie consent you have to give on most website and if CNAME trackers actually follow the visitor's choice? Uh, no, we did not look at that. Well, that's a very different issue. Well, related, but different. Um, but I believe that CNAME-based tracking would be no exception to needing consent from the user to perform tracking, but the way that it is branded is just that it's more meant to deceive and less transparent. But I believe that users, that um, trackers and websites still need to obtain consent to track the users. But that's again a different problem, whether it's GDPR compliant or not. Mm. I think there's a question coming up by Stefan. And another one by Matthias. Do you have experience or I assume knowledge of whether these trackers also sell data to third parties? Um, I know that some of them do. Don't know exactly which. Um, I believe that it was on the news that Ghostry was, for instance, selling some information while branding itself as privacy preserving. So that's obviously also an issue that you have to take into account when you're choosing your tracking protection tools. Mm. Did you have an, did you look at the impact of cookie blocking by the user on the uniqueness of their browser fingerprint? I, I don't, this doesn't actually relate to um, CNAME tracking, right? But No, uh, it's an interesting question. We did not do it. I would love to do it. <laughs> Yeah, exciting. Are there more questions from the audience? People, you can just open your mic and join the discussion. Maybe that's easier than typing everything. Well, what are you planning to do next with this? Do you, do you plan to extend the study and, and, I don't know, do more evaluations, understand more what data is actually gathered about users or how to defend against CNAME um, um, tracking? Um, well, currently don't really have any plans on that, but I think it would be interesting to do a follow-up study and uh, follow up on the, indeed, the protection measures that are implementing defenses against CNA-based tracking. Okay. I see still a few questions coming up, people typing. So let's wait a second. I Maybe I can I use have... the meantime to announce the next seminar, which is going to be on, well, there will probably be one in May that is not announced yet. On the 22nd of June, we're going to have um, Stefano Fantin from CTIP presenting about accountable software vulnerability handling and the responsibility between uh, states and intelligence agencies. It's already on the website. Here you have an overview. Okay, now we have more questions. <clears throat> Is it possible to create virtualization systems similar to light beam add-in also for this first party tracking or does that not make sense? Um, I don't even understand. It, I don't even know what light beam is, but okay. Yeah, me neither. But is it um, is it like a visualization of the the third parties that are connected with each other, 
and websites yeah um well because of well this i guess it does make sense in the case of cookie syncing but generally first party tracking is not meant to be cross-site so you could not per se link different trackers with each other but you could yes i guess have an overview of the website and the different I mean, the, the websites that are using this method and the trackers, and if some websites are using multiple trackers, which also happens. Wouldn't it actually make sense to provide protection against that, not in a browser, but at, I don't know, operating system level or something like that? Like in a different mm -hmm. DNS resolver that tries to filter out tracking subdomains? Mm. I'm just wondering, you, you could build this kind of tracking into random applications and no one would notice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It would be an interesting issue. Yeah, I also have a question. I'm not sure if there is a legal definition for who is a third party, but I'm just wondering, and I'm also asking this from the legal experts that are in the audience. But isn't there a legal binding on who is controlling the subdomain? Like, um, um, I don't know much about it. Maybe someone with more legal experience. Maybe Tom or Levin or some of the people who work with DNS or, or the CTO people, I don't know. No, I also don't know these things. Folks, it's really easier if you just speak instead of let us wait for your typing. So Bettina, if you want to say something, then just open your mic. Thank you. <laughs> You're completely right. Yeah, it, it just takes forever, and we are just staring yeah. at the at the at the yeah. line here at the bottom, waiting for people to finish typing. And it's dehumanizing to a certain extent. Um, so, just about that third party question, um, I think I recently read something uh, that alerted me to the fact that there is some legal finesse in GDPR about uh, things that we think are third parties are not actually third parties in the sense of the GDPR. So it's even more complicated. Um, then, then, you know, just thinking it's somebody else. Um, and, uh, I don't, I'm not a legal expert, so I cannot tell you what uh, exactly are the ramifications of that. But, uh, I think whenever we read anything about this question, we have to keep in mind that, uh, in the legal domain, there's a very tricky definition of what is the third party is and what isn't. But I also, I would like to also uh, support that earlier remark about uh, Lightbeam. Um, Lightbeam is really a very efficient uh, communication tool for the problem of third party tracking, um, uh, third party cookies. And I think this is a call to action for everybody who might be here who's working on visualization. It would be extremely helpful if people came up with good visualization metaphors for this new type of threat. That's all. Thanks, Bettina. Um, yeah, about the third parties. I mean, I'm not a legal expert either, but um, I believe that they, there is no definition in GPR of what a tracker is, right? It's all about which data you're collecting and for what purpose is the purpose tracking or advertising, but I don't know. If anyone else more knows more about it. I'm even wondering, how do I give consent for third party tracking? With the cookie banner. Yeah, but I always assume the cookie banner is for cookies. Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's true. Uh, 
not that anyone still reads cookie banners and makes conscious choices there, but I still have the feeling that the cookie banner, that whatever content you give with clicking yes or no in the cookie banner shouldn't extend to all kinds of other forms of tracking. Yeah, that's true. But if I may intervene, Jan Tobias, nevertheless, that's decayed. I mean, this is where you should, you should consent. And in some cases, first party um, cookies, um, you don't need to consent because they're necessary to let the website function. Mm -hmm. Legitimate interest on, on the website, on the side of the website. Um, but for third party cookies, you cannot invoke. So you need to rely on consent. So somewhere you do consent. Otherwise, it's it's simply illegal. Mm -hmm. It's not just the GDPR. When we talk about cookies, there's actually the privacy directive, yes. which is currently yes. being revised. Uh, that that also does not mention the term cookie, but that um, refers to the need to consent to have data stored on your device. Um, so this is this is actually the cookie provision. Yeah, but but with these things, sorry for, for putting in, the biggest issue is that they all assume that you store anything on your system, even for the new uh, e-privacy um, for the e-privacy directive update, it was always assuming you store something on the system. Yeah. So anything like security is um, problematic then. That's why I actually ask this, how does this relate to fingerprinting and fingerprintability? Yeah, excellent, uh, excellent remark. Uh, indeed, this is something that we've had students look into in the past. Uh, can you apply this provision uh, that is that is made for cookies also to browser fingerprinting uh, where, where nothing is stored on your device? Um, Actually, the the uh, Article 29 Working Party and now, which is now um, um, EDPB, European Data Protection Board, they have issued a couple of opinions in the past which interpreted these notions quite broad, so that also browser fingerprinting would would come, fall under it. I have um, there must be decisions by DPAs on this. I just don't remember from the top of my head what they are saying. Uh, I see that there are other CTIP colleagues. Here who may be able to help, but the, the, the ones that are specialized in this domain are not in the meeting. Um, but I can, uh, well, we, we can check this and, and during the next seminar, provide you with an answer on this. Um, but as far as in the discussions on the new e-privacy regulation, um, because the directive would be replaced by a regulation, which would be immediately, um, yeah, applicable even without the national law and just like is the case with the general data protection regulation i don't think that um, this requirement of, of uh, storing data on your device would still be the case i thought they would uh, modernize that and would also by the way uh, the browsers um, those who operate or, or are in charge of operating systems to uh, centralize uh, settings so that you would not yeah. for every website that you that you visit, Jan Tobias, uh, click through all the cookie consent policies, but that you could store your choice centrally in your browser, and and then that would be uh, every site you visit. No, I I agree with you that that as far as I understood uh, the the efforts from the legal side that. Uh, they probably don't require uh, that you store something on the device. But the problem is, of course, uh, from the side of the defense, the question is whether the user or any uh, uh, law enforcement or whoever can actually detect that this uh, tracking is, is mm. happening. And if you can't detect it, you cannot enforce basically this. That's why I asked this question, what is the impact on fingerprintability? Because fingerprinting is uh, potentially stealthy, you cannot see it necessarily. Um, yeah. Well, this is where this type of comes in and is extremely valuable. Uh, you may remember that also the face, the Belgian Facebook case started with research done by you guys, <laughs> you and Kose, uh, so people from District and Kosik, 
um, showing that, that Facebook was tracking also non-users uh, so -called, eh, for so-called security reasons. Um, so if, if you have found valuable insights, I would recommend you to share that with the Belgian DPA, if, if at least the, the, these are Belgian websites that are involved. Okay, interesting discussion. Thanks a lot. Jana, comments from your side? Or anyone else having a question? Then I think we are reaching the end of this CIF seminar. Thanks a lot to Jana for giving an interesting talk. Thanks a lot for everyone particip participating in the discussion. And we're going to see each other at some point in May again. Um, Enjoy the Christmas weather outside. Um, have a good time. Bake some cookies. And yeah. See you next time. See you next time. Thank you, Anna. Thank Ciao. you. Thank you. Yana, did you? Bob, I, I missed part of the presentation. Is this something that has been published already? Um, uh, well, yes, it will be published in BEDS in June, but it's already online, the paper. I can link it if you would like in the chat. Yeah, maybe you share a link. That could be good. Sure. Can I just add something as well? Uh, just out of curiosity, I googled it a bit, and uh, of course, uh, in this arms race, then the web uh, pages to tell you how to circumvent uh, blocking of CNAME cookies. Um, you you have these, right? I mean, like the the next level. Um, I, I'll show you what I've. The, well, that's very interesting, um, but I of course haven't had time to read it yet. I'm just looking at it. I, I think I'm, I'm beginning to lose track how many iterations in the uh, in the uh, game we have here. Yeah, of course, it's just an ongoing arms race that is not going yeah. to finish anytime sooner. Eh? Yeah. This paper can already be downloaded, Jana, but it's officially published it's a, it's in the revision process is that it um it will be officially published i don't know what the what this current stage is called to, to what extent can it be shared by with people already it can be shared without any oh problem. yeah yeah uh, uh, no. it's official yeah i already saw it on the pets website so it's official as official as it gets yeah, right, but, uh, I would, I would definitely bring this to the attention of the of the DPB. <laughs> this this is this is uh, significant, if you ask me. I, I can forward it if you want um, to a couple of people there, um, because I don't remember which you, you didn't uh, name any particular websites. Eh? You said the, the, you talk about popular websites, but yes. In order to determine whether um, or which DPA in one of the member states is competent, we, yeah, you, you would be able to name uh, a website. Is there a Belgian website involved? If so, then the Belgian DPA can start an investigation. If not, then yeah, it will have to be. But I think this this is if this is really meant to evade. Um, yeah, the, we now have this whole uh, so-called transparency policy towards cookies, so you need to be transparent as a website about the cookies uh, and, and comparable tracking um, uh, that you allow, also on, be, on behalf of to the benefit of third parties. 
So if this is a way to evade that, I mean, this is this is really. <laughs> Yeah, it's the way they brand themselves. So, and um, actually, we're planning on making um, results public um, in the future. And I already had a look, and there are some fifty Belgian websites. Some of them were a little disturbing, such as banks, bank websites that were present in the data set. So it's really worth looking at. Mm. Great. Nice research. Thank you.